This is Johnny and Jose with Tiger Bomb MMA. We'll be going over UFC 258 Usman versus Burns. Give me your thoughts and predictions as always. And we've had a couple card fights dropped, or I should say a couple fights drop off the card. Our first preliminary fight is Diego Lima versus Bilal. Remember the name, Muhammad. It's a fun matchup for Bilal Muhammad, really, because I don't see a way where he doesn't come out with the decision win. Because Diego Lima, he's been on a pretty good win streak. He's got three wins, uh, what one by knockout against Chad Laprise, which was honestly surprising. I, I didn't expect him to actually be able to put it together since he's had quite a, a weird stint in the UFC where he was just Diego, or not Diego, but he was uh, Douglas's little brother who just couldn't cut it. And uh, he recently beat Luke Jumo about a year ago. So he he's able to get a split decision there. Honestly, I think Bilal Muhammad is just a better version of Diego Lima. He does everything slightly better. His pace is ridiculous, and he's only lost to top tier guys. He got knocked out by Luke, which I remember talking up Bilal Muhammad to my to my cousin, I'm like, "Oh, this guy is something special. He's really tough." And then, bam, he's on the floor. Uh, but no, and then his his last loss was to Jeff Neal. So we know how good Jeff Neal is. And then he's just been able to just go through guys. He's been in some in some trouble with Lyman Good, but I liked what I saw. He was able to persevere. So I do have Muhammad to win by decision. I agree. I think this is Muhammad's fight to lose. Uh, I don't see anywhere uh, where Diego Lima is going to dominate Muhammad, either on the feet or on the ground. Um, I don't think there's any recency bias. Uh, the only bias that some people might associate with him is the last name Lima. Uh, you know, his brother being the champ in Bellator and all, they're going to think, oh, that's going to translate over to Diego, you know, a la, and he's going to have the same success, sort of how, you know, the other, uh, the Diaz brothers have kind of rubbed off on each other in, in a sense. So with Diego Lima, the only the only bias I think people are going to see is uh, his last name, uh, Lima. His brother Douglas and Bellator his success uh, hasn't translated uh, this is Bilal uh, I think he's going to come out with the decision victory uh, he'd have to either come in in really bad shape which I've seen a lot of guys do uh, or just be really dumb in the octagon uh, or just leave himself wide open and be overconfident uh, I think he, he if none of those things happen then I think uh, Bilal Muhammad is going to have uh, not necessarily a easy peasy time but he will come away with the victory uh fairly unscathed that he should be ready to go for another fight maybe in a month or two or something all right our next fight at lightweight we've got bobby king green versus jim a10 miller uh the odds currently are minus 250 for green and a plus 205 for jim miller interesting fight because at those odds really it's jim miller by submission is always an interesting an interesting bet, but quite frankly, honestly, the way Bobby Green's been fighting lately, even though he recently lost to Tiago Moises in a fight that a lot of people were complaining, saying that Bobby Green edged it, you know, he 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 got complacent in that fight where he kind of let Moises dictate the pace, and he honestly he deserved to lose that fight. He should have pushed the pace a little bit further. As for Jim Miller, he's had a rocky last few fights, lost to Scott Holtzman lost, or actually he beat Roosevelt Roberts in a huge upset, arm barred him, which was actually something you predicted. And Fink Pachel, it's hard for me to say, I don't know, for whatever reason, he, he decisioned him. But it was an interesting thing to see because we saw how old Jim Miller looked in that fight with Fink, where at a certain point he was just getting dominated on, on the ground by a guy who, although is a good ground fighter, he's not anywhere near the level of Jim Miller. And we've seen Bobby Green take it to the ground with some pretty dangerous black belts. He took down Alan Patrick. And I think, honestly, at this point, we might even see Bobby Green get a, a TKO over over Jim Miller. So I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go Bobby Green to get a TKO. He's a very good decision fighter, I would say Bobby Green is. But the way he's been putting his combinations together and when he's on, he's amazing with his striking. So I'm going to go Bobby Green to win this fight maybe later TKO round number three. I'm actually pretty surprised uh, that this fight is so low on the card. Uh, I, I don't know if this is necessarily uh, um, a co-main event, 
uh, it's you know a fight that I'm actually looking forward to. I'd, well, to be honest, I'd rather have this be the co-main event than the current co-main event. Uh, but this is actually a fight I'm looking forward to. Uh, Jim Miller, he, he's just a fighter you can never count out. I did predict this correctly. I did see Jim Miller uh, beating Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, I didn't. I uh, I think I may have predicted by submission, but I didn't expect that to come true. To be honest. Uh, the only reason I did predict uh, Jim Miller is you can really never count him out. Despite him losing his last fight uh, to Vince Pichel, or Vink Pichel, however you pronounce his name, Jim, uh, you know, Jim is, uh, you know, I, I would, I would, uh, I would say Jim is similar to Clay Guida, who recently, who just this past weekend, beat Michael Johnson, which isn't saying much, but then again. Uh, Michael Johnson's kind of a strange fighter in that he fights to the level of his opponents or just, it's strange. It's, you know, when he fights, when he fights high, super high level fighters, he, he takes it to him. But when he fights Clay Guida, who's not exactly at the top of his game anymore, he just, you know, shits the bed. Um, I, I could, I could say it's something similar to Jim Miller uh, in that Vince Pichel, while he's not a world beater, he did dominate. Uh, Jim in that fight, which everybody expected, his it's just his offensive grappling and wrestling, uh, or just a step above Jim Miller. But I think Jim Miller's, and to that point, I think Jim Miller's uh, offensive grappling and wrestling is, you know, a step above Bobby Green. Bobby Green is the type of fighter who who will get kind of cocky in the middle of a fight. He has that that very you know. It's kind of annoying uh, because uh, what's his name that knocked out? Uh, Kevin Holland has that sort of thing as well, where he get he gets cocky, uh, and it actually almost cost him the fight, uh, the fight against the dentist guy from from uh, from England, Darren Stewart. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it almost cost him that Stewart. I mean, he did win that fight, but he has those moments where he gets a little too cocky, and it's like, bro, you're gonna you're gonna it's not always going to turn out that way. You know, he's going to get cocky and then he's going to get caught one of these days. And I, I, I see that a lot from Bobby Green as well. I mean, he has, you know, a lot of success. Um, I did have him beating Lando Venata as well as Alan Patrick. However, he didn't, he, he just took his foot off the gas against Diago Moises. And if you do that against Jim Miller, you know, while Jim Miller seen better days, he will take advantage of that as not great as Jim Miller looks at times. When he smells blood, he goes for it. So this is this is going to be an interesting fight. On the feet, I give Bobby Green the advantage. However, if it goes to the ground and if he gets lazy or just overly cocky, uh, Jim Miller can definitely get that submission, either an arm bar or uh, just choke him out. I see this. I don't see either guy dominating short of Bobby Green just getting cocky and Jim Miller taking advantage of that. Uh, I don't believe it's, I don't believe that's going to be the case, but you know, anything can happen in these fights. Uh, per the odds, if you are going to take a shot at Jim Miller, that submission prop uh, is probably the way to go. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be taking a side here just because I, I don't, I don't really have a good feel for, for either fighter. I'm coming off, each coming off a loss while they're, I don't think, I don't know. No, I, I shouldn't say that neither guy is uh, with his back against the wall because uh, a lot of fighters actually just got cut, including that alpha ginger who he's been demoted to beta ginger at this point. He, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take the over here. Uh, I, I'm, I'll say this fight goes the distance, but I'm not really honestly overly caught, overly confident in that fight myself. In that prediction myself. All right, our next fight at featherweight, we've got Ricky Simon versus Brian Boom Kelleher. Uh, the odds currently have Ricky Simon minus 255, the return on Kelleher plus 200. And just to cut to the chase on this one, it's essentially how confident are you in Ricky at those odds that he won't get finished? Because Brian Kelleher, he's a dangerous guy. He's he's got knockout power, and he can choke you out. 
and it, it's a prime position for him to either clip uh, Ricky Simon or catch him in his in his nasty guillotine. And it's 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 up to you really how you want to go about it. Quite frankly, I do think Ricky is overall the better fighter. I think his pace will just stifle Brian Kelleher. I think Ricky's going to be smart enough not to get caught in that guillotine. I think he's learned his lesson to not get too damn full of himself and then go out there with his chin up in the air against Uriah Faber and getting that, his damn head knocked in, costing a bunch of people some money. But I think I think he has learned his lesson because he's got wins over Mirab, for God's sakes. I know that was a weird one, but... He got the win. His win over Ronnie Yaya, he just bullied him. He just picked his picked him up for the for the double leg and just slammed him on the ground, not even following him, just dumping him. It was one of the the nicest bits of wrestling I've ever seen. What did concern me was Rob Font. That lost to Rob Font, but it's in the past. I don't consider Brian Kelleher to be on the level of Rob Font right now. Uh, and the other thing, really, Brian Kelleher, although he does have a win via submission, it was against Ray Rodriguez on short notice. I'm not too overly impressed. It's going to be a butt clencher on this one, really, because quite frankly, I think Ricky's going to take the decision. I don't think he'll finish Ryan. I will think for, for sure it's going to go with decision. I just don't think that Brian will be able to capitalize on on any of the possible mistakes that Ricky's going to going to exhibit. So I'm going to go with Ricky Simon by decision, but it's not an ultimately confident one because I can absolutely see Brian just booming all over Simon's face. I couldn't put it any better. Um, short of him getting boomed all over his face um, and that I do see this also going to decision. Uh, I think he's... Yeah, that loss to Brian, uh, excuse me, to Rob Font, Rob Comic Sans Font, uh, didn't look too well. Neither did his previous loss to Uriah Faber. Uh, so unless, I mean, he hasn't gotten beat by, well, the last time he got beat was by Anderson Dos Santos, um, which is the bastard child of Anderson Silva and Junior Dos Santos uh, back in Titan FC. That was the last time he lost via submission and he's actually won uh quite a bit since then so it's not too big of a concern however unless he gets uh, i see this as, as his fight to lose i don't see him getting allowing uh kelleher to just do as he pleases on the ground uh i, I don't see a giant mismatch uh so i'm not going to say he's gonna <clears throat> excuse me he's gonna finish him uh, this is uh, this is a close one. I think the odds are way off. I think it, the odds should be a lot closer. I think it should be, you know, in the minus 120 plus 120 range. Uh, I don't see Ricky Simon as being that big of a favorite. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know if it's going to climb to three to one odds, but at two to one odds, I think it's he's overly, you know, he's overpriced. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't see a. I don't want to say I don't see a clear winner. I see Ricky Simon maybe edging it out but and having enough sense to stay out of a submission. But if he gets overly confident or comes in underprepared or out of shape, which seems to be a theme now, uh, you know, uh, post-COVID, during COVID, whatever this, you know, the, you know, whatever you want to call this time after, you know, March of last year, uh, hopefully, you know, it's his fight to lose. So uh, I'll I'll agree with you. I'll go with Ricky Simon by decision, uh, but I'm not really counting out Brian either. Our next matchup at 125 pounds flyweight, we've got Jillian Robertson versus Miranda Maverick. Uh, the savage Jillian Robertson's coming in at a slight underdog, my, uh, plus 125. Miranda Maverick at a slight favorite, minus 150. I think the odds are perfect, really. Because, honestly, I, I, her last matchup, Jillian Robertson, I think I put a little too much respect on her. I, I thought she was the, the grappler of that division. The, not necessarily, I don't want to say the Damian Maya of that decision, but Damian Maya's second cousin's girlfriend who does jiu-jitsu, whatever that equivalent is, I thought that was Jillian Robertson. Because, you know, I, I saw her, I'm like, yeah, her grappling's really good. Her control on the bottom's really good. 
So I'm like, maybe I've been too harsh on Jillian Robertson because I was critical about her in the past. I honestly consider her to be a just a scrub in the division. But she pulled off some good wins, and I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be bashing her. I actually took a shot on her against Talia Santos because I thought Talia Santos had a deficiency when it came to the grappling, her just being a primarily a Muay Thai gra- uh, fighter. And the fact that Talia Santos took her down and dominated her on the ground, her specialty just really... I, I reverted back to not being a fan of Jillian Robertson. Like, I can't believe she let herself get handled that way. And quite frankly, Miranda Maverick, I don't know too much about Miranda Maverick, but I was impressed her last fight when she blew up uh, Jojua's nose. Uh, so I'm actually going to have her to win this matchup. More than likely round number one. I think she'll come out here aggressive. Jillian Robertson does tend to be a little mental in the cage. If she can't get a takedown, she kind of freezes up for a moment. I mean, if she gets a takedown, good for her. She she can control the fight for a bit, but I think Miranda Maverick's just going to be too much for her. Unfortunately, she'll have two straight losses. Definitely don't see her getting cut. She's too much of a, what, insta-thought for her to get cut. But, uh, no, I see I see Miranda Maverick kind of beating her up a little bit, giving her some uh, some more lines on her face. So I will say officially Miranda Maverick, round number one, TKO. Uh, I'm going to say this fight goes a distance. I'm going to say they're, I think they're grappling. I don't know if it's going to cancel out necessarily. Uh, but they're going to, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to skip this fight. I, I don't really care, to be honest. Our next matchup at middleweight, we've got Rodolfo, <laughs> the black belt Hunter Vieira versus Anthony Fluffy Hernandez. Now, all I've got to say is I'm sorry, but I'll see you later, Fluffy, because you're not staying in the UFC any longer. Rodolfo Vieira, Vieira, I should say, heavy favorite, minus 400, come back on Anthony Hernandez, plus 290. And it's sad to see how much Anthony Hernandez is being disrespected by the UFC. They don't want him anymore. They want him gone because they're, they're giving him Rodolfo Vieira, undefeated 7-0, just a masterful grappler and... I see it being one takedown and that being it. So sucks to see, but I, I don't know what the hell Anthony Hernandez did, but he must have pissed somebody off for him to go from fighting Kevin Holland, another killer, to fighting Rebofo Vieira. It's like, no, their investment from the contender series didn't pay off. Back to the minor leagues, brother. So I do see Rodolfo Vieira coming in here, getting that one takedown, maybe round number one, overpower Anthony Hernandez. And just smother him and get the neck or whatever whatever he wants, he's going to get. I don't think Anthony Hernandez has the grappling to fend off anything Rodolfo Vieira is going to present. The only way, just for fun and shits and giggles, the only way I can see Anthony Hernandez maybe winning is by a finish. Maybe, maybe exhibiting some sort of high-level movement from... Israel Adesanya to just avoid getting taken down and just piecing up Rodolfo Vieira. But Rodolfo Vieira isn't one of these like lower level Gracie fighters from Bellator who get beat up by random scrubs. He's going to get that takedown. He's going to get that submission. Round number one. Sorry to see you go, Anthony Hernandez. His nickname aside, um, I don't, I think the odds are a little bit overinflated. Minus 400, that's pretty. That's maybe twice what I'd... Oh, no, he's going to get dominated. Yeah, that um, submission prop. Oh, go with the submission prop. Yeah, that's going to bring it down a bit. I mean, I, yeah, they're, they're, try, they're just trying to price... They're trying to price this so that they don't lose as much. Uh, but I think uh, this is definitely one of those spots where you probably want to include them in, your, in one of your parlays. Uh, this isn't women's MMA where, you know, the overhyped uh, submission or overhyped, uh, you know, insta-thought is going to come in here unprepared and get knocked out. Uh, here's looking at you, Rebas. By Anthony Hernandez, who does not have the same skill set as her name escaped me, who knocked out Rebas in her last fight. Uh, Marina Rodriguez. Marina Rodriguez, yes. I, it, uh, she, yeah, she exposed her for what she is, class chin, Rebas. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to suck for this, for Anthony Hernandez. But this is definitely not going over one and a half rounds. Uh, That submission prop, 
this ending in the first round prop, the under one and a half prop, uh, I'd say just throw all your money there. Uh, unlike the Chiefs, I think this is uh, this is actually going to come through. Our next matchup at welterweight, we've got gifted Gabe Green versus Philip the Fresh Prince Rowe. Frankly, it should be Uncle Phil the Fresh Prince Rowe, but it is what it is. Um, interesting matchup. I honestly not impressed by Phil Rowe. The last fight I, I saw him in was the, the tape I saw on him versus that Shabazian kid. I'm not sure if that's, um, I don't know if it's uh, Edmonds, little brother or whatever, but Le Leon Shabazian kind of got handled for a little bit, and then he came back and just whooped his ass. But I wasn't too impressed by him. He's a little too tentative, but when he goes forward and he throws hands, he's crazy. The odds currently are damn even, minus 115, minus 115. What I see here is really height and reach for Phil Rowe, uh, and because right now he's what he's six foot three compared to a five ten for uh, Gabe Green, and uh, eighty and a half inch uh, reach for Phil Rowe, and what seventy three inches for Gabe Green. Mm -hmm. I will say this: despite Gabe Green losing his last fight to Daniel Rodriguez, I actually liked what I saw. He was, he went for it. Like he came in on a short notice. If I recall correctly with short notice, you can check me on that. But he, he looked pretty good, right? I liked what I saw. He, he never gave up. He didn't, he didn't make it seem like he was out of place in the UFC, right? He looked like he belonged in there. I don't really know if Phil Rowe belongs in the UFC. I know he has a bit of hype being a long, tall dude, kind of reminiscent of Neil Magny. But he ain't no Neil Magny. I don't think he doesn't fight anything like him. This could be something where I'm wrong, but I do see Gabe Green coming in here, potentially getting the the knockout round number two. I think with a full camp, he's going to show what he's all about. Uh, Phil Rowe, he was put in some positions I didn't really like. Again, even though he won that fight against, uh, I don't want to call him the shitty Shabazian, but the equally shitty Shabazian, he, he didn't look too great. I wasn't too impressed. He's going to have to show me something in this matchup. If he comes in here and handles Gabe Green, Props to him. Like, maybe it was just an off night, but from what I'm seeing, I'm not too sold. I'm going to go with Gabe Green on this one to win round number two knockout. I don't see Gabe Green knocking out Phil Rowe. Uh, he looks more, he's more of a, I'd say, Carlton in a Fresh Prince body. Uh, he isn't, he should have, you know, his physical attributes should give him you know, uh, every, well, not every, but uh, quite a bit of advantage over his opponents, especially having a five, five inch height advantage, nearly, uh, well, he should be, uh, allegedly has a seven and a half inch reach advantage. So that in itself, you know, should give him the physical attributes to have the striking advantage over his opponents. Uh, but he doesn't, for some reason, he, I see Gabe Green actually uh, not knocking him out, but uh, bullying him for most of the fight. I think Gabe Green is going to pull out the decision. Uh, he's going to get on his inside uh, and just piece them together. Uh, I think Phil's going to have a tougher time uh, in the later round than the second and third round because he's not going to really know. Uh, I don't think he he's bothered uh, looking at himself objectively and figuring out what he needs uh, what he needs to polish, and and that's his footwork, his defense, uh, and his boxing. Um, being that he he hasn't bothered to look at himself objectively, I think Gabe Green is going to come in and just find those weak spots in, in his those chinks in his armor. Uh, but I see Gabe Green. Um, uh, I see this fight going over. Uh, I see Gabe Green getting maybe a split decision. Uh, but I don't think Phil Rowe has it in has it in them to objectively compete in the UFC. I think they're trying to weed out a lot of these guys who don't belong in here. And I think Phil Rowe, Phil Rowe is one of those guys. He's gonna he's gonna be probably competing with the Alpha Ginger pretty soon. Our next matchup at Strawweight, we've got Pollyanna Vienna versus Mallory Martin, and I'll just try to keep it as simple as possible. Do you really think a woman that lost to Hannah Cyphers and JG Aldridge? Belongs in the UFC? I don't think so. 
Her last fight was against Emily Whitmire, and she pulled off a, a submission win, which then put Emily Whitmire from four and three to four and four. Fantastic. We've got the odds currently at a plus 130 for Pollyanna, a minus 165 for Mallory Martin. Funny enough, I actually faded uh, Mallory Martin her last fight against Hannah Cyphers, which is funny. I thought Hannah Cyphers was just going to beat her ass, which she actually did. But she gassed out, and then she got rear naked choked. Uh, the only good news is that Mallory Martin did show us how tough she is, and her grappling is up to par. She's able to take girls down and submit them at will, whether it is because they got tired or whatever. She, she got the win, and it is what it is. Uh, her last loss for Mallory Martin versus, was versus Janjaroba, Virna Janjaroba. You know, it, it's a respectable loss. Uh, she's 7-3. and three. Whatever, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, Mallory Martin to win this one by decision. This is another one I'm not going to waste my breath on. Uh, yes, Pollyanna Viana is worth keeping around, at least for the weigh-ins. Other than that, I don't think she has much to offer unless they're going to, at this point, if if she does, uh, it doesn't really matter what she does. I think they're going to probably uh, set it. Um, set up a fight with her and Rebots, you know, sort of as a revenge sort of fight. She's going to knock her out again. Uh, so it doesn't, I don't think it really matters. Uh, Pollyanna Viana is not really going anywhere. She's ranked number 41 at straw weight, holy macaroni. Yeah, unless she pulls off some really serious victories, which I don't see happening after those losses, especially to Hannah Cyphers. I'm spending too much time on this. Uh, let's move on. I, I don't know what to about our next matchup at catch weight of 140, 140 pounds. We've got a matchup between Mr. Highlight, Andre Yule, and El Wapo, Chris Gutierrez. A very last minute fight. Uh, I know Andre Yule is supposed to fight Cody Stamen, but I forgot what happened there. It doesn't matter now he's fighting Chris Gutierrez. Quite frankly, Chris Gutierrez is going to, going to attack those calves, and I, I don't know if, uh, I, I don't know, man. I don't think he's going to be able to handle those calf kicks. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this one either because of the, the fact that it's a short notice fight. Damn near anything can happen. I don't know how well these guys are going to come into the shape. Andre Yule might have the advantage because he's had a camp, at least for Cody Stamen, so he has an idea of what he's facing. But that was a wrestler boxer. Now he's fighting more of a, a kickboxer with devastating leg kicks. Uh, quite frankly, El Guapo is really just going to put it on Andre Yule being the taller, lankier guy, calves aren't always the strongest. They're not as thick as most dudes. So taking a couple of those, I see Andre Yule grimacing pretty badly, and I see Chris Gutierrez going after him. Um, I will say I, I do see TKO as to what round. I'm going to say maybe accumulation of damage in round number three. I can see Andre Yule just no longer being able to take it going down. Chris Gutierrez, round number three, TKO. Funny enough, I, I actually pictured the fight going exactly the same way when I kind of looked at it in my mind. I don't know if he's going to – I think he's going to batter his legs and he's going to you know try switching stances throughout the three rounds. Uh, I don't uh, I don't think there's going to be a TKO here. I don't, I don't think Chris – I don't know if he has it in him or not, but I, I just haven't seen it from him where he has that killer instinct when, you know, he smells blood, he goes into that kill sort of thing. And I don't mean, you know, how some of these guys, when they see somebody fall, they just jump on them and, you know, try to rabbit punch them or slap them or do all that. You know, I'm, I'm talking more about sort of the Jim Miller effect, you know, where, or, or similar to what Jim Miller does when he smells blood, but he goes for a neck or he, he goes in for the kill. He doesn't go in, you know, to try to, you know, rabbit punch guys and make it seem like they're out of it, you know, just because they're throwing a hundred, you know, baby punches or whatever. Uh, but I do see Andre Ewell um, rethinking his leg workout after this fight. Uh, he's definitely going to want to put some meat, you know, on those, on those branches and making tree trunks afterward. Um, so, yeah, so I see. Um, well, I don't think odds are out for this fight just yet since it was 
pretty new, but I do see Grisco Gutierrez getting the decision. Uh, so it might be a good parlay piece. Our next matchup at middleweight, we've got Kelvin Gastelum versus Ian the Heine Heinish. This is a matchup where Kelvin Gastelum is in dire need of a win. He's on a three-fight losing streak where he has losses to Jack Hermanson. He has losses to Darren Till and, of course, the loss to Israel Adesanya, where, honestly, that's the last time he looked so damn impressive. I, though I, I saw some glimpses of some greatness in Kelvin Gastelum in the Jack Hermanson fight. Ultimately, he fell, he fell prey to that heel hook, and that was a wrap. As for Ian Heinish, really, he had a, quite a bit of a rough time. He got brunson pretty bad, and he got semi-exposed there. And then he got Wolverine by Akhmedov, which is, again, those two losses, they aren't horrible on your record. At a certain point, having Derek Brunson as a loss on your record was considered a horrible thing, but Derek Brunson's really been proving himself as the type of guy that's like, hey, I'm not going anywhere in this division. His last fight, he knocked out uh, Gerald Mearshot, but a lot of people do that, so it's not super impressive. I honestly, I see this one being either a cakewalk for Kelvin Gastelum or honestly, Kelvin Gastelum might just break again because he has a tendency to not perform sometimes. Like I, I remember the fights with Neil Magny when he's in elevation with him uh, in Mexico City and he's losing the fight. He's getting taken down by a guy he shouldn't be taken down by. And then he comes back strong in the, the later rounds, but it's a little late, it's a little too late. Uh, as for, for Heinish, he kind of like a utility belt. His striking has looked improved. His, uh, his knockout of Gerald Mearshard, although, again, it's Gerald Mearshard. I was impressed by it. He, he set things up pretty nicely and, and landed that overhand right. Uh, I don't think, I don't think uh, Ian's going to be able to hurt Kelvin. I think Kelvin's got a pretty damn good chin. But what concerns me is that he did take some punishment from Israel. And I know that was some time ago. Uh, but sometimes when you fight guys like Israel, you're never the same again. And, and I'm concerned at those odds, uh, the odds currently are minus 215 for Kelvin and a plus 175 for Ian. That at those odds for Kelvin, you you it might have it might not be any value really. It might be a dog or pass situation. Uh, the only thing that I can see is that because it's literally Kelvin Gastelum's last chance in the UFC to get a win for the time being, because he's looking at getting cut at this point. A guy at his salary being the ultimate fighter winner. I mean, four straight losses, that's saving some money for the up-and-coming dudes from the Contender Series to get signed. He has to win this matchup, absolutely. It's just that I don't know if I want to take a chance on him. I, I think I'm going to go with uh, Kelvin to win this one. Uh, he might even use his wrestling just to edge out a decision. So Ian Hines has had issues with some cardio, so we – we haven't really seen him too much since those issues with Akhmedov and, and Brunson since he had a really quick knockout eight months ago. So he might have sharpened up that that cardio. But uh, knowing that Kelvin absolutely needs it, uh, needs this win, I think he's going to do anything in his power to get the decision. So I'm going to go with Kelvin Gastelum to win in a safe decision win. Uh, this matchup to me is a big question mark. And the reason I say that is this this should be Kelvin's fight to lose. Uh, but I think it's, he has not looked good in the past. Uh, let's see, when did he fight Adesanya? Almost two years ago. He has not looked good. Uh, I think he fell, he fell a little bit complacent because he did, you know, he did okay against Adesanya. He didn't win the fight, but he stood toe to toe with him. Uh, but he's gotten lazy in the last few years. He has not bothered using his wrestling. Uh, you can tell by his um, by his physique, he's not really training all that hard. You know, he's training, uh, which I can only guess is basic striking, and but he's not really doing the type of conditioning that he's using years ago, where he was even to when he was on the Ultimate Fighter and beat Dry Hall. You know, he was using his wrestling, and you, you can tell that he was in pretty good shape back then. Uh, but I guess he's falling complacent, having gotten a few wins over the years against some names. Uh, I think his last win, uh, his last two wins actually were against Bisping and Souza two, you know, almost three years ago. 
Uh, and I, I think he maybe felt complacent because he didn't really have to use his wrestling and whatnot. And while he isn't the biggest fighter in the middleweight division, you know, you know still having that wrestling uh, to fall back on, I think, uh, would, would benefit him greatly, especially when maybe he's not doing so well in the striking department, uh, which he isn't always going to do, uh, just because I think, I think against Adesanya, he just, Adesanya got lazy. He just let Kelvin, you know, tee off on him. More so than Adesanya, uh, excuse me, more so than Kelvin just having a fantastic, you know, having fantastic boxing. Uh, I think Adesanya underestimated him in that fight. But anyway, uh, this is his fourth fight. This is, I don't know if he's going to get, you know, his back is up against the wall. Uh, he, if he does get this loss, you know, he's gone. I think he has, at this point, subpar, uh, just subpar everything, you know, his, from his ground game to his, to his boxing. So I think they've, that's why they've matched them up with Heinich, who isn't exactly, uh, this, whatever number he has in front of him, he isn't top 10 material at this point either. Uh, Kel is definitely going to fall out after this fight. Definitely going to fall out out of the top 10, regardless of what happens. Uh, but I think he's just falling complacent over the years. I, I see this fight going over, whether Kelvin wins or not. I don't think he's made the necessary adjustments uh, from his last fight with Hermanson, which was six months ago. I, even if none of this COVID crap was happening right now, I don't think he would have, you know, really looked, taken a hard look at himself and, you know, really pushed his training, uh, his, you know, to get back uh, to get back that, add that wrestling, um, you know, add the cardio, add strength, which he needs. Uh, you know, he, he knows how to throw a punch. He knows how to throw a kick. You know, I don't think he needs to work on that too much. Uh, but, you know, I don't think he made the necessary adjustments. Sucks because I like Kelvin. I think he's cool. Met him. Nice guy. But I think he's too complacent. He's, he's fallen... Uh, maybe he fell in love with himself after getting a few wins. I don't keep saying that, but it's true. At least in my eyes, it is. Our next matchup in the middleweight division, we've got Julian, the Cuban Missile Crisis Marquez versus Mackie Coconut Bombs Batolo. And I, I just want to cut to the chase, really. Uh, Julian Marquez hasn't fought in almost three years. His last fight was a disappointing fight against Alessio De Chirico. As for Mackie Batolo... He makes some very questionable decisions in fights sometimes. Um, fought Impa Katangana. He thoroughly got whooped in that one. It was a, it was a pretty entertaining back and not, not even back and forth. It looked like a back and forth affair in a striking battle, but Impa was in control the whole time. Darren Stewart, he looked pretty good for a couple of seconds, and then he went for a, <laughs> for a takedown. And he must have not thought that the British kickboxer would guillotine him, and he got guillotined. His last win was against Charles Bird. And frankly, there's some things that Mackie Patolo has that I really like. I like that he, he attacks a body. He goes above the weight class that he normally fights in because he, he's fought at welterweight before. And quite frankly, that was horrible. He got dominated by Callan Potter. So going up and fighting in his natural weight class is a good sign compared to Julian Marquez, who is a beast of a man. He's a huge, muscly man, and he for sure cuts weight. And with that weight cut, comes the cardio issues. Currently, we have Marquez at a minus 185, the return on Patolo plus 145. And honestly, I do see some value on Patolo. This could be a dog or pass situation because we don't really know how well Julian Marquez is going to look in the fight. So I'd like to see the weigh-ins and see how he looks, if he comes in, in shape, if he doesn't go over overweight. Because Patola is going to come in weight, he's going to attack the body, and that's going to severely drain Julian's uh, gas tank. Uh, but as an official pick, I can't pick Mackie Patolo. I have to go with Julian Marquez. I think if even if even uh, if everything's going poorly for Julian Marquez, I think Mackie Patolo might make a huge mistake and then just get clipped and knocked out. Because at this point, I don't have much faith in Mackie. But if that line goes higher, like maybe a plus 200, I might take a shot on him because I, I can see him just 
wearing on Julian Marquez and then maybe even potentially TKOing him in the later rounds. But my official pick will be Julian Marquez. I'm going to say by decision, I don't think, I don't really think Emaki Patolo is going to get clipped and knocked out. He's a tough Hawaiian dude, right? So uh, I'll go with decision Marquez. I'm actually going with Maki on this one. I think Marquez has been out way too long. I think he's going to come in pretty rusty. And I don't, you know, guys that have been out that long and come back during this era, they do not come in in great fighting shape. Maki, I think he's going to be able to throw those coconut bombs uh, to Marquez's body and wear him out for three rounds. I don't think he has what it takes to necessarily knock him out, but I think he's going to definitely take it to him. Well, he's going to be the shorter guy by four inches. Uh, I think he. I don't think. He's, I don't think he's going to have that that tough a time getting through Marquez's defense uh, and just lay, you know. Uh, I don't think he's going to lay him out, but I think he is going to take it to him, uh, maybe against the fence, because uh, I don't see Marquez taking down Maki or you know trying submissions or you know trying trying under hooks and getting control of him and whatnot. Uh, he's not that technical. Um, I think. I think the wrong guy is favored here, uh, especially since while Maki has gotten his ass beat in the last two fights, he does have more recent, you know, he's got sort of a, I don't want to say he has, you know, he, he has momentum coming into this, but at least he has more recent, you know, he's, he's been in the octagon a lot more recent than Julian. So he has at least that kind of flow going at least. Uh, so I think so. I'm gonna take actually uh, Maki by decision. I like Maki, despite him losing to the dentist and uh, Impa. Impa's a Impa. I mean, they're not they're not they're not bad losses because Aaron Stewart is really really tough. As is Impa. He just got caught. It's one of those things. And I, if anything, I I don't think Impa has fought in, has fought Darren Stewart. That would be a fun fight. But yeah, so I'm taking Maki by decision. In our co-main event at Flyweight, we've got Macy, the future barber, versus Alexa Grasso, the return of the future Macy Barber. Her last fight was a huge letdown spot against Roxanne Modafferi, but we we learn when we bet in women's MMA, all of you guys, that Roxanne Modafferi will whip on your future prospects. She does that. That's what she does. She She has a peak, of course, but she will school on some chicks on on the ground and just make them look silly as for alexa grasso Mm -hmm. quite the opposite she makes herself look silly sometimes because she has so much potential with her with her boxing and her overall striking game her movement you know she's she's good she's a good overall prospect but dear god she she sometimes doesn't pour it on enough like the fight with uh carla spars i know you remember that one where She's getting dominated in, in Mexico, for fuck's sake. And then she decides, you know what? I'm going to go for it. And she starts beating her ass a little too late to, to lose the majority decision. And, you know, similar with the fight with uh, with a little bulldog, a Philly Sarig, where we get that famous face that's on the, the screen right now where she's super shocked and creates a Pikachu face. It's like, dude, you lost that fight. Like, you you thought you did enough. The fact that she thinks she does enough in a fight where she's not performing pisses me off, and it, it gets me worried that she's not mentally there yet. She's not mentally mature enough to be a top 10 fighter or even a top 15 fighter. As for Macy Barber, although, you know, she got handled, it's nice to know that she's going to go out there and she's going to do whatever she can. Like, she's a tough chick. She will fight through adversity even though she loses the entire fight she's not going to quit honestly although i'm saying that about macy barber i'm still not sure i'm still not sold on her alexa grasso does have the advantage when it comes to you know experience she's fought the way tougher girls Uh, currently we have alexa as a minus 150 and macy barber coming in at a plus 120 and it comes down to this uh, alexa grasso If she decides to show up, she is fantastic, right? She will get a decision win. But we don't know how well Macy Barber has adjusted from her surgery. I think she tore ACL or whatnot. It is what it is. And we don't know how 
she will come back from that loss. Will it be like an O'Malley effect where she's thinking to herself she's not mentally defeated, which is the dumbest shit ever? Or will she accept the fact that she lost that fight, get better, and prove to everyone that she wants to be the youngest UFC champion ever? It's a tough one, really. I'm not betting this one at all. I will go with the underdog just for the hell of it because I like to go with women's MMA underdogs. I actually do think Alexa Grasso might be put in a situation where she thinks she's winning and she just, I don't know, she gets dropped or something and she loses the fight. So I'm going to go with Macy Barber to, the win, to win this one by decision. I'm not taking any sides in this fight. Uh, it's another women's fight, uh, another low-level women's fight. Um, looking at Alexa's record, I think she's set to lose this fight. It's, you know, she uh, trades off wins and losses. Uh, and that's not to say, you know, I'm, I'm super high on Macy Barber, uh, despite whatever numbers that they have associated uh, with the rankings. Uh, she lost to Mata Ferry, um, which, I mean, I like Roxanne in the sense that, you know, she's, you know, she's, she's that underdog, uh, you know, like you mentioned, she's a, She's a prospect killer. <laughs> um, it's it's a weird thing. I mean, she just, I don't know, man. She brings it to those prospects and just kills her hype. Um, uh, so I don't know, man. Uh, Alexa's just, she has okay striking. Uh, she's just, and it's not because she trains in Mexico or she's Mexican, but she's just never bothered improving her wrestling or grappling. You know, she's, uh, she's mainly a boxer. Uh, she throws, I think I've, you know, I, I don't really recall too many of her fights. And I didn't really bother looking into her, to be honest, uh, because I've seen enough of her in the past to where she's she's a very basic fighter. She's not, she came in with some hype and the UFC hoped to have her be, you know, a female Mexican star, but it just didn't work out. She's not, she never bothered, uh, you know, doing, you know, training in anything, but her striking, she already knows how to strike. She, Anyway, um, I, I, don't, I don't really see one having a clear advantage over the other. Uh, while, while, yes, Alexa has fought the better competition, Macy's last four wins before her loss to Mata Ferry were all knockouts. So I wouldn't necessarily count her out, but at the same time, I'm not really confident in either to finish each other. So I'll just take the over. Uh, I, I say this goes the distance. In our main event of the evening, we've got Kamaru, the Nigerian Nightmare Usman versus Gilbert Durinho Burns. Very, very interesting matchup because Gilbert Burns came up from lightweight after getting knocked out by Dan Hooker, and he's just been phenomenal. He's just been really overperforming. He's been winning certain fights that he shouldn't have been winning on short notice, even Gunnar Nelson. Uh, he knocked out Damian Maya, and then he Donkey Konged him into oblivion and on the ground. Then he beat Tyron Woodley. Most people didn't even think that Tyron Woodley would lose to a guy that just, you know, a, a lightweight coming in with a quote-unquote fluke win over Damian Maya. I'm like, no, 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 you got to put some respect on Gilbert Burns. And then, as I did, I put money on Gilbert Burns to beat up Tyron Woodley, and I had a fantastic night that night. Uh, as for Kamaru Usman, he's been the rightful number one of that division. He's, he, you know how you have dudes that say like, oh, well, uh, this champion hasn't fought X fighter. And when they fight X fighter, they're no longer going to be champion. That's not really Kamar Usman. Kamar Usman fought the guy who I thought was going to be champion and in, in Colby Covington, and he knocked him out. And that's fantastic. That was a great fight. He, he beat Jorge Masvidal in a horrible fight, but he beat Jorge Masvidal short notice or not. You know, it is what it is. If, you, if you're going to be the baddest motherfucker and you're always ready to fight, you're always ready to fight and you can't fall back on the thing of being short notice. So it's a very interesting matchup. We've got the dynamic of the, the two teammates fighting each other, which is pretty badass, really. When, when I found out that they were, you know, teammates and Gilbert was the one who initiated the, the thought of, hey, I'll fight you for the title, it's, it's pretty cool. I like Gilbert's fire. But is it enough to really beat Kamaru Usman? Because Usman's a strong dude, right? The matchup, how I see it, is that, you know, Gilbert is a threat on the ground and he's a threat on the feet. And Kamaru Usman is primarily a wrestler and a wall installer, and he's got pretty good 
actually he's got some pretty incredible cardio. Like it's kind of surprising because I know he has bad knees, but his his cardio is pretty excellent for going tit for tat with Colby Covington, who's like the cardio king. Uh, I've been impressed by Kamaru Usman as much as I don't really necessarily like Kamaru. I respect the hell out of him for what he's been able to do, and you know the type of guy he's a, he's a good guy. Honestly, I I don't know. It's hard to pick a side because I I do really just want to sit back and enjoy this one. I would like to see Burns win because I don't know. I think he's he's really I don't want to say he deserves it, but the way he's been fighting, just short notices, it'd be nice to see him win the title, and you know maybe have another Brazilian champion. But damn, it's really really tough to bet against Kamaru Usman because he does have power in his punches as well, although he doesn't normally knock people out. He is a powerful guy. He's a really strong guy. I think he might just do the same thing that he did to uh, to Jorge Masvidal and just kind of wear out Gilbert Burns. And I don't know. I, I can also see Gilbert knocking out Kamar Usman or submitting him. It's really going to be a fun matchup just because I have to pick a guy. I'm going to go with Burns, the underdog, just because as an underdog, he seems to overperform. He might shock the world because he is a plus 215 underdog currently. Uh, Kamaru Usman is coming in at a minus 275. I'm willing to take a shot on him. Like I've done it each and every time. I bet against. I bet on him with uh, Damian Maya to win. I bet on him against Tyrone Woodley, and he's just never failed me since. I'm going to take a, a shot on the, on the dog. I'm going to go with Gilbert Burns to win. Oh, man. I'm going to say decision. I think he might just outwork Kamar Usman. So I'll go Gilbert Burns' decision. I hate saying this, but I'm actually going with Kamaru. And the reason for that is he is going to try his best to make this a shit fight, just like he did with Masvidal. He's, he's number one, and he's the champ at avoiding action. While he did go toe-to-toe with Colby, you know, Colby isn't really, you know, a knockout sort of guy. He's more of an outworking sort of guy. So he's he's more of a, you know, Diaz type fighter with good wrestling, essentially, instead of the jujitsu and the peanut butter mouth. Uh, I see this fight going similar to how it did, you know, to, to uh, the Colby Covington fight aside. Kamaru is going to avoid action at all costs. Gilbert's a better striker. Uh, he has great uh, jujitsu, uh, but Kamaru's going to avoid all that. He's just going to probably hold him up against the fence, maybe take him down, stay in his guard, not really do much. Uh, he's just going to, you know, crotch sniff his way to victory. Uh, as much as I'd like to see Gilbert as champ and, you know, him actually fight uh, these other guys and, uh, you know, make, you know, make exciting welterweight championship fights again. I don't know if he's going to take to, uh, I don't know if he has what it takes to get past Kamaru's uh, cardio and his, uh, you know, his wrestling, which unfortunately makes for boring fights. Uh, so I'm, I'm going with Kamaru at, uh, you know, by decision, which is going to help bring down the odds um, to something a little bit more, but I'll, I'll probably include him in a parlay piece. Those have been our picks for UFC 258, Usman versus Burns. Let us know what you think about our picks in the comments below. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. And you know what? We'll catch you in the next fights.